Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, uh, uh, Psalm. Would you do that? The book of Psalms in uh, chapter 85. Psalm 85. And, uh, and I, I hope you all get used to me pretty quick. Amen. I, I hadn't got to meet many of you. I shook a couple of hands before church. But um, it's always better when we get used to each other real quick. That way you can... Like some things I say, you might understand why I say them and know my heart. But um, revival is my heart. Revival is my burden. And uh, this, this, this verse, I don't know how many times I've preached this verse in all kinds of different ways. But uh, verse 5, uh, verse 6, I'm sorry. It's, the Bible says in Psalm 85, five, 6, Wilt thou not revive us? What's that next word? Again that thy people may rejoice in thee. A result of revival is rejoicing. Now this world's got it all messed up. I'm talking about the so-called Christian world. They think if you get your band up here, and you got you know, jamming for the lamb and all that stuff and get people all stirred up and hooping and hollering, then you have revival. No, revival's hard. Revival is humbling yourself and praying and seeking His face. Turn, amen. That's, that's, that's no fun at all. But when you do those things, He'll hear from heaven. He'll forgive your sins. He'll heal your, heal your lands. And then we rejoice. And so I, I know we'll forget one night I was preaching this, this verse. And um, I just got started. And God starts asking me a question while I'm preaching. Now, I'm, I'm sure, preacher, you've had him give you a message while you're preaching, give you another message. You say, oh, I hope I remember that, you know. And, uh, but I've never had him ask me a question while I'm preaching. And I realized that he wanted an answer. It's hard to concentrate when you're preaching a message and you're talking to him and he's asking you a question and you've got to think what the answer is. So I don't know what I said to them people, amen, but I'm trying to, you know, I, I respect him more than I respect you, amen. So I'm trying to give him my attention. And the question was this. He says, Blanco, he calls me Blanco. Uh, he said, Blanco, do you see many people rejoicing? And so I'm trying to preach, and I'm trying to answer his question. I'm trying to think, do I see many people rejoice? You know, I'm trying to think of the churches I've been, where I've been, and different things. And I thought it was confusing, so I thought, well, I'll just look where I am right now. So I was looking around while I was preaching, and I said, no. That was the answer, no. He said, you see many people rejoicing? I said, no. He said, no rejoicing, no revival. A result of revival is rejoicing. Now, rejoicing can mean a lot of things. Um, I've, I've been known, listen, if this is going to alienate me from you, I, I'm so sorry. But I've, I've been known every once in a while to get so excited, I'll just take a lap around a building. Woo, glory to God, amen. I, don't, I rarely do it. I haven't done it this year. But I'm apt to do it tonight. Y'all know what that means, apt to? I mean, it could happen. But I, I don't just go around running around buildings unless I just feel like doing it. Uh, but I doubt anybody here is, will do that. Just looking around. There might be a couple of you. Might. Anyway, anyway uh, rejoicing can mean a lot of things. Uh, rejoicing can mean doing that. Rejoicing can mean doing the wave. I mean, you, you ever see ball games and woo, you know, sit down. I've seen people doing pews, woo, woo, you know, like that. And, and that's fun. It's, I mean, some of y'all right now, you say, I don't know about this guy. I've got Bible for the running thing. I do. I have Bible for the running. You remember when David brought the ark back? And the Bible says he danced mightily before the Lord. And then he went up to his wife's, you know, went, to, um, went up to the room. And, and she said, he said, did you see what went on down there? He said, yeah, I saw that. She, she said, act like the, one of the foolish ones down there. And David said, God chose me before your father's house. Her, her daddy was Saul. God chose me before your father's house to make me king over Israel forever. Therefore will I. Anybody know what the next word is? play before the Lord. He was playing. So, you know, I've been told for years, you can't play in church, and they are reading the Bible, it's okay to play in church, amen. But anyway, uh, it, it can mean doing the wave, it can mean, it can mean a lot of things. Uh, hopefully, 
an appropriate amen wouldn't be too fanatic for anybody. You know, decently and in order. <laughs> but let's say, you're, it's, they say that's too far. That's, that's pushing the edge. Because I've actually encouraged people to say amen and, and, uh, and the, uh, the husband to say amen. Then he looked at his wife, make sure it was okay. <laughs> you know, come on, get on some man pants, brother. Amen. Anyway, but maybe that's too much for you. Let's just draw the bottom line, rejoicing, the bottom line. Everybody ready for this? Rejoicing, bottom line, smiling. Is that too much for anybody? Amen. You don't see much of it at church. You don't see much of it at church. For a lot of reasons, but the one main reason is we need revival. If you had revival, you'd be at least smiling <laughs> it'd be at least smiling if you had revival if you experienced some revival and and you know some sometimes i come in charged up ready to go and, and then i ask somebody how they're doing i hadn't talked to anybody this here yet but listen if i ask you how you're doing i don't mean it <laughs> that's just a way to get a conversation going you know i don't want to hear i i got my own problems i you know, I'm an AFib right now. So, so don't tell me your problems, amen. Uh, that's just a way to get communication going, amen. We don't want to know how you are. I mean, I've, I've, now I'm watching these, these old, it's me TV. It's for old people. It's all the old, you know, shows and stuff. And I know it's for old people because of the commercials. It's old people commercials. You know, heart and liver and brain and all the other stuff, you know, amen. I, I, can't, I can't stand it, Amen. But anyway, wilt thou not revive us again, that the people may rejoice, which means at least smile. It says revive us again. So apparently it's possible to have more than one revival. Let's look over in Romans chapter 7. Would you do that, please? Romans chapter 7. And we'll read about the first revival. Romans, book of Romans, chapter 7. Love the book of Romans, good, great place for doctrine. Romans chapter 7, verse 9, the Bible says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So what this verse is talking about Paul said, there was a time when I was not under the law. There was a time when I was not accountable to the law. Now, when is that? When you're a baby. When you're a little toddler. God takes care of babies and toddlers. If they, if they pass away, God, God takes them up to heaven. Amen. They're, they're, they're innocent. They're not under the law. But Paul said, then the commandment came. In other words, he got to the point where he knew, he knew the difference between right and wrong. He said, and sin revived, and I died. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. So somewhere along the way, there came a time in your life, and there came a time in my life, when we were innocent and we were uh, free from the law, and then we, the commandment came, sin revived, we became sinners, and we died spiritually. When a little child, a little, little toddler, four or five-year-old kid, and they say, I'm praying for you, I appreciate it. They can get one through. Their spirit's alive. But there comes a time, and it's not 12 years old. I don't know where people get that. It's not in the Bible, amen. But sometime a person gets to where they know the difference between right and wrong and they become sinners and they're obligated by the law they're under the law and then Christ died for the ungodly and there again in Ephesians it says you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin when I got saved he quickened me when I got saved, he took my dead spirit and resurrected it. He took my dead spirit 
and made it to where I could talk to him again, where the Bible could talk to me again. Amen. I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. That was my first revival. And I hope you've had that first one. You say, well, we're in church on Wednesday night. I, I know that. And I was in church on Wednesday nights for 10 years before I got saved. Amen. You're not saved because your mom and daddy saved. God doesn't have grandkids. He only has kids. Amen. So I just, I, and I don't care how old you are. You might be 60 years old, and, and you've been in church because your mom and daddy put you in church, and you've just always been in church. If you haven't been born again, you'll go to hell. You need to be saved. You need to be revived. You need that new birth. Amen. You need your spirit to be quickened. You need to be saved. And I'm thankful to the Lord that when I was 18 years old, I experienced that new birth. I joined the church when I was nine years old. My dad was a drunk. I'm a bus kid. Amen. Uh, people came by our house, wanted us to ride the bus to church. We did. Next Saturday, they came, knocked on our door. Uh, they talked my dad into riding the bus with us. And uh, my dad came two Sundays, and my dad got saved. So I was a bus kid for a month. Amen. Then daddy took us to church after that. Praise the Lord for that. But listen, I didn't get saved. What, what happened? My dad, there was so much of a change in my dad's life that when he got baptized, I went forward, went to, they took me to a room, they showed me verses, and I'm sure it's probably the Romans wrote, I mean, the church, I know the church, and they, I'm sure they did the right things, but I just, I just wanted whatever daddy had. I wasn't convicted about my sins. Amen. I knew I was a sinner, but I wasn't convicted about it. But uh, nine years later, ten years later, is when I got saved. So I hope you've experienced that first revival. I hope you're saved here tonight. Since then, for me, and since then, probably for you, when enough world and enough flesh and enough devil gets in you, it's almost like you're not saved. You don't have any power in your prayer. The Bible doesn't talk to you. You're not a bold witness. You don't have any power. It's almost like, you, almost like you're lost. And I, probably some people have made another profession when they get in that condition. But that's not what you need. You need to be revived again. Not get saved again. You need to be revived and I'm glad God is in the reviving business. God, God, listen, turn over to 2 Chronicles, and I, I'll just show you some things here. In 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 7, uh, from, I'm sure you're familiar with this passage. But let me say, there's, there's so many similar, similarities between salvation and revival uh, let me just give you a couple here anyway. In, in salvation, um, it takes humbling to be saved. You have to realize that you're lost. That, that's, that's a hard thing. I've talked to some people, and, and sometimes you maybe lead them through a prayer or something, and I'll say, uh, Lord, I deserve to go to hell. And they say, I don't, I don't think I deserve to go to hell. And then you're not ready. You need to understand that you're lost. And so um, um, being, being saved is hard because uh, you have to humble yourself. And revival, the verse you're looking at now, 714, if, if my people which are called by my name shall, what's the number one thing? Humble yourself. It's a humbling thing. Revival is a humbling thing. Revival is asking God to do something you can't do for yourself. And that brings me to my next point. The, the similarities between salvation and revival, both of them are acts of God. You can't get saved outside of God. And you can't get revived outside of God. It is God who sends revival. Another similarity between salvation and revival is this. Salvation, the hardest part of getting saved is getting lost. I mean, we got our religion, we got our good works, we got all this stuff we're depending on and, and hoping and, and all this stuff. And let me say this, if you're hoping, you, you may not be saved. Listen, I have hope, but I'm not hoping that I'm saved, amen. I know I'm saved. I'm not hoping and I'm trusting Jesus Christ, amen. I know he saved me. 
But uh, listen, the hardest part of getting saved is getting lost. I mean, I mean, when you get to the point to where you know you're a sinner, and you get to the point where you know you deserve to go to hell, and you get to the point to where you know you don't know God at all, when you get to that point, uh, you're almost saved. Because, see, he's the one that does the saving. So when you get to the point to where you know you're lost, you're really close to getting saved. Boy, that's what Paul told that king. He said, he said you're not far from the kingdom of God. Boy, that, that king left him alone, wouldn't talk to him anymore, amen? Because he, he, he knew he was close. In revival, the hardest part of revival is really believing that you need it. One thing, we compare ourselves with other people. We're not as bad as that church. We're not as bad as them people all around, you know. If I were to ask tonight, and I, I don't want you to raise your hand, but if I were to ask, how many here truly need revival? If I were to ask you to raise your hands, many of you, if, you're not, if not all of you, would raise your hands. But you know somebody who really needs it. I mean, you would say, I need it, but you know somebody who really needs it. And if you know, if you know somebody who really needs it, you really don't think you need it. You're going to try to make it another week. Let me say this, and I'll move on, because some of you want me to move on. Amen. <laughs> but the, the Bible doesn't use there's backslidden is not in the bible backsliding is in the bible well we would like to think we would like to think that we were on this spiritual plane now we're on this spiritual plane we're, but we're going to stay here no this is the way it is you're going to be worse tomorrow than you are today unless something happens you're going to be worse next week than you are this week. You're going to be worse next year than you are this year. Ten years from now, if something doesn't change in your life, you will not imagine where you're going to end up. Wilt thou not revive us again, that the people may rejoice in thee? If we get to the point to where we know we need revival, then we're getting close. We're getting close. So let's look at this verse in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 now. <clears throat> if my people does anybody qualify anybody raise your hand if you qualify my people Christians say people amen if my people which are called by my name Christians Christians shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, here's the difference between salvation and revival. Would you like to know the difference between salvation and revival? It's this. In salvation, God is the pursuing party. God chases after sinners. The Bible says we've all gone out of the way. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, there's none that seeketh after God. I mean, but, but, but God is chasing after us. I mean, listen, uh, he chased after me at least for two years, if not longer. But I know two years he chased after me. Amen. So in salvation, God, God chases you and chases you, and you're not willing. I mean, you're hard to get. Uh, like my wife, I mean, listen, I like to never caught her. I mean, she just wasn't willing at all. And she could run pretty fast, amen. And uh, so I just, you know, turned on my Tennessee charm, and uh, that didn't work either. <laughs> so I just prayed. Amen. That's all you can do is pray, amen. So she, then she let me catch her, amen. I, I thank the Lord for that. And uh, in salvation, I ran from him and ran from him and ran from him. And boy, one day, he showed up again. I said, yeah, I want you. I want to be saved. I want to know you. And God saved me. Listen, in salvation, God's the pursuing party. In revival, if my people will humble themselves, if my people will pray, if my people 
will seek my face, if my people will turn from their wicked ways, then I will. Can you see the difference? See, in salvation, we're just running from Him, and He's chasing us. In revival, we're chasing after Him. Let's look at that verse now. Just four things. If my people which are called by my name shall, number one, humble themselves. Humble themselves. Now, we've got this funny um, perception of humbling. We think humbling means thinking lowly of ourselves. and We're just the lowest of the low. That's not what it means to be humble. Being humble just means not thinking about yourself. That you don't count. You don't get an opinion. You don't get a vote. That's what it means to be humble. You, you just, you're, you're out of the picture. Um, God showed me that because one day I heard a man talking about pride. He said pride is not necessarily thinking highly of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself. I mean, I actually heard of a guy that wrote a book, Humility and How I Attained It. I don't think he was humble if he wrote a book about it. So I'm saying this. A lot of us think that since we don't think highly of ourselves, that we're humble. But we're still thinking about ourselves, about how lowly we are. Revival is when you start thinking about Him. You wake up thinking about Him. You go to bed thinking about Him. You want Him more than anything else in the world. You want Him more than any of the world that you can attain. You want Him more than any popularity that you could attain. You want Him more than any pleasure you could ever have. You want Him. You want His presence in your life. If my people would humble themselves, if my people would just stop thinking about themselves. So here, four things here. If my people would humble themselves, let's just stop right there, just, just in the scenario of that verse. Let's say that we get people humbling themselves. What's God done so far in this verse? Nothing. Are you with me? Just in the verse, if my people would humble themselves, you stop right there, God hadn't, God's not doing anything. He says, and pray. And pray. I was just reading a verse the other day. Uh, our our, our um, camp last week was the theme was prayer. It says, and when you pray, not if you pray. Evening, morning, and at noon, will I pray. That's what David said. You know, these Islamic folks have a lot of issues. I'll just stop right there. I won't say anything else about it. But they pray five times a day to a false god. And we say, oh, look at them. They're praying five times a day to a false god. How many times do you talk to the real one? And he invites you to come in boldly. So how many times do you just come in boldly every day and say, here, here I am again? If my people would pray. Brother, <clears throat> of course, I'm old. But used to, on Wednesday nights, we had prayer meeting. And you would not believe what we did on prayer meeting night. Anybody want to guess what we did on prayer meeting night? <laughs> we prayed. We prayed. That's what we did. And then it started turning into the called Wednesday Bible study. Which is fine if you transferred prayer to another time. I know some churches have prayer meeting on Saturday night. And, and what they do, they just come down here and pray. But he said, if my people would pray. 
if my people would humble themselves, stop thinking about themselves, if my people would pray. Okay, let's say that we got some people that are humbling themselves now. They're, they're taking themselves out of the picture. They're just putting God first. And now, now they're, they're praying. We got people that are Christians. Call after his name, humbling themselves, praying. So far, what has God done? Nothing. And seek my face. And seek my face. I think the closest most of us come to seeking his face on a regular basis, you're really seeking his hand. God, do this for me. God, do that. Do that for that other person. It's not really seeking his face. You're seeking his hand. Um, when, when, I, when, I, when I fell in love with my wife, it took me a long time to get that. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I asked her to marry me in a letter, in a very juvenile fashion. Will you marry me? Yes or no? I had two boxes. Amen. Sent that letter off. Waited a week. <coughs> I called her. She lived in California. I live in Tennessee. I said, in the course of conversation, I said, I sent you a letter. Oh, you did? Yeah. I said, I asked you a question in a letter. Oh, did you? What'd you ask? I said, you'll get the letter. <laughs> Called her another week. I said, did you get the letter? Yes. I said, what's your answer? She said, I sent you a letter. <laughs> Amen. We made a very wise decision. We were both, both in Bible college. A very practical decision. She had one more year of college, so the decision we made was that we would go through school that next year single, and they get married the next summer. That's a very practical, thought out, well thought out plan. So here I'm in Tennessee, and there she is in California, and I'm working, and I'm letters that's it you, you don't even have like FaceTime you don't have Skype you know you write letters like with your hand and pen some of you young people don't have a clue what I'm talking about amen <laughs> put a stamp on it <laughs> long distance is like a lot of money <laughs> Amen. anyway um, after a month of that I called her and I said honey we got to get married this summer Oh, I don't know. You better talk to my daddy. I said, put him on. You can get bold over the phone. Amen. Never met the guy. So um, he gets on the phone. He doesn't know what we're talking about. I said, hello, Mr. Jones. And I talking to him. I said, I, I want to marry your daughter. He said, yeah, I've been hearing about that. And maybe you can come out this summer. We can meet you and everything. And, and we can get everything planned, you know, next, the following summer. That was, was going to work out great. I said, no, this summer. We want to get married this summer. Hello? <laughs> Mr. Jones? <laughs> oh, I, I better talk to my wife. I don't know if that's going to work. I said, it, it'll have to work. I said, we, we want to get married this summer. Now, the reason I wanted to get married that summer was not because I was looking for a cook. My mama was a great cook. Listen, I'm... I'm surprised I was, I think, I think the reason I was skinny is because I ate so much, it made me poor to carry it all. I mean, just, <laughs> I don't know. But my mama was a good cook. Her first fried chicken she cooked for me, it, brother, it looked so good. Oh, it looked, it smelled good. I bit it, I like the legs, amen. I bit into that leg and blood went everywhere. <laughs> but that's not why I married her. I didn't marry her for what she could do for me. I didn't marry her so she could iron my shirts. Amen. I didn't learn how to iron a shirt until I had the Bible college. And you just iron this part right here. That's, that's all it shows. I mean, so you just iron right there. I, I learned that in Bible college. I never made a bed until I got to Bible college. My mom made my bed every day. I don't recommend it. I didn't know how to make a bed. But I didn't want to marry her until I could have somebody make my bed. As a matter of fact, usually I make the bed because she gets up first. <laughs> I would seek in her hand. 
for what she could do for me. I was thinking her face. I just wanted to be with her. Letters were not with her. Phone calls were not with her. I want to be with her. God said, if my people would just want to be with me. If they just seek my face. And, and when you look at this, these, this verse, when God says, if my people would humble themselves, what's he saying? My people are proud. When he says, if my people would pray, what's he saying? My people don't pray. When he says, if my people would seek my face, he said, my people don't seek my face. So let's say that we got this thing down. We're, we're humbling ourselves. Uh, we're, we're, we're stop thinking about ourselves, thinking about God, and, and, and um, we're, we're praying now, and, and, and now we're, we're, we're seeking His face. We're just wanting God, wanting, seeking His face. What's God done? Nothing. I'm trying to show you that salvation was pretty easy, but revival is a little more difficult. Both of them are acts of God, but in salvation, God initiates it. And in revival, we initiate it. And turn from their wicked ways. Now what's he saying? My people have wicked ways. There are things going on in the church today that 30 years ago lost people didn't do. Christians go to places today that 30 years ago lost people would sneak to. There are things Christians say today that 30 years ago lost people would say it and smirk. It was like cussing. Now Christians say it. We have wicked ways. He said, my people have wicked ways. But he said, if you'll humble yourself and you'll seek my face and pray and turn from your wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. Even when you look at that, before these four things took place, has he been hearing from heaven? No. Now, he's bailed us out. I mean, when we're, when we're out there, amen, our head's going down for the last time, he'll, but I'm talking about him hearing us. The Bible says, I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. But he said, if you'll, if you'll do these four things, then I'll hear from heaven. And I'll forgive your sin. And I'll heal your land. Give you that joy back. Remember when you first got saved? That joy that was there? Son, the night I got saved, I was 18 years old, the night I got saved, I guess church was out at 9, 9.30, I don't know when it was out. I didn't get home until 1 o'clock in the morning. I drove all over Nashville telling my friends I got saved. And I figured they'd all get saved too. I just knew they would because, I mean, why wouldn't anybody want to get saved? I was excited about the Lord. You get revival and you'd be right back there. Excited about God. Excited about praying. Excited about the presence of God. I think Vance, Vance Havner, an old-time preacher, he said most of our churches start at 11 o'clock sharp and end 12 o'clock dull. I like going to church when he comes. And there's a lot of folks. When he don't come, the service don't change a bit. We just do every, all of our stuff and we just, oh, we had a good church service. But we know he didn't show up. We need revival. We need revival. The biggest word in the Bible, if. That's the first word in that verse, if. 
What if his people don't humble themselves and don't pray and don't seek his face and don't turn from their wicked ways? He's in no way obligated any fashion. It's up to us. Now, pastor didn't tell me what your goal is for this meeting. He just said it's an outdoor meeting and just, just gospel preaching and all that stuff. But I'm just telling you, my burden is revival. We need revival. And I'm thinking he can still send it. But we're going to have to talk him into it. We're going to have to talk him into it. If my people. Could we bow our heads please? Could everyone bow their heads?